My name is Mila Martinez. I'm the RP1 lab assistant and I will be talking to you about sampling and chain of custody protocols. So the purpose of this training is to ensure samples are legally defensible, that our sample collection and preservation requirements and techniques are up to par, and that our sample documentation such as labels and chains of custodies are uh, completely filled out and correct. So we're going to go into sampling. So we have the two sample types that are defined in the NPDES permit. We have the grab, that is any individual sample collected in less than 15 minutes. And our comp, that is a combination of no fewer than eight individual samples obtained over the spe specified sampling period, that is usually 24 hours. So if our compositors experience a failure, bring in that volume that was collected with an additional grab. Um, usually we only get that grab, but we need both of those samples. And please clearly label the bottles and the chain of custody with any notes of that failure. And here we have a collection and preservation. So to ensure that valid data comes from our samples, the container type and preservation must be in accordance to the EPA guidelines published in the Federal Register um, that is summarized in your Table 1 handout. And the NPDES requirement and lab certification requirement, um, so they're both requirements for both of ours and theirs, and we need that every year to be certified as a lab. So we need those to be properly um, preserved in the proper containers. Okay. And here we have our sample collection. So the type of bottle we have either plastic or glass. So the glass only um, samples are oil and grease and organics. And then we have our plastic only samples, which are samples that require the test for fluoride, boron and silica. And preservatives, if a, pot, if a bottle contains a preservative, do not rinse or overfill the container. Some or all of the preservative may be lost, resulting in improperly preserved samples. Uh, the preservatives can be a liquid acid form, a tablet of sodium hydroxide, or even some powder uh, like ascorbic acid. Just make sure it remains in there with the sample. And the temperature of the samples must be kept at six degrees, but not frozen. Uh, sometimes we do have trouble receiving them under the temperature, so make sure we carry them in ice. Sample collection, do not fill the, bo the bottle to the top. Always leave some head space. It's important for us to be able to mix it thoroughly. So here we have a sample that I received that barely had any head space. And this one was a good sample that we received as well. Um, I have noticed that the trend is that on weekends, we get the samples full all the way. So um, sometimes they come in like this picture and most of the time they come in like this. So. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but we do need them to be, um, you know, partially empty because when we mix them, we're not getting a full, make sure full representative sample. So that's the good one. That's the bad one. So as I said, they're shaken before we're poured out to, you know, analyze them. And we need a representative sample. If it's not completely mixed, it's not going to be representative and the, neither will the data. So with limited airspace, the sample is not mixed properly, therefore the sample poured out is not representative. So here is some data that we did. So for, these are mixed liquors from RP1, and these are aerations. When there was airspace, those were our data points. Without the airspace, you can see they're significantly lower. So when that happens, they have to make adjustments in the plant, and what if it's an unnecessary adjustment just because it wasn't thoroughly mixed? So here I have a demonstration. So this is like if they were the solids. This one, if it's filled all the way to the top, you can tell that the colors don't mix. This one's if it's partially, you can see that the colors start to mix. So that's kind of how it is. Some molecules are denser than others. They sit at the top and others sit at the bottom. So it is important for us to be able to mix them. And why can't we just, you know, pour some out and make airspace ourselves? Because as I said, some of them are denser than the others. What if we poured out something that was significant for our sample, and then it's not a representative sample of all of our composite or all of our grab. So the only exception that we have for this is our volatile organics, the 40 mil vials. Some of you guys have had to deal with these in the past. Some of you guys haven't. These cannot have any air bubbles in them whatsoever. 
we have had to send them back when they do have air bubbles. So we like them to be filled up to the top like that, to have kind of like a dome. So you can see closely. Um, we also send these with trip blanks. Don't open our trip blanks because then our sample is pretty much invalid and we have to recollect the entire sample. We always have a little tape to make sure that the seal isn't broken. Our coliform samples must be filled up to the four ounce line and they also have to be brought down to six degrees. Like I said, this is kind of hard because the coliform samples are usually grabbed. It's harder to bring them down to six degrees, but the lower it is, the better. You know, we understand that sometimes there are times where we can't, but we should try to get it as close as possible. So now we're moving on to labeling. So sample bottle labeling, of course, we write on the bottle or on the bottle and the lid, especially like with the wide mouth um, containers, usually for the solids. We use permanent markers or ink pens, no gel pens or like those fountain felt pens because they smear. And at a minimum, the label must contain the source, the location, the type of sample. That one's really important. The dates, the time and preservative, if any. Um, usually I have the bottles with the preservative stickers on them and then you guys' initials. So that's an example of a sample I got f with uh, a gel pen and I couldn't tell what it said at all. So that's why we don't use those. So here is a properly labeled bottle. It has the source, the location, the dates, the time, the temperature, and their initial. So that's like exactly what we want there. And then this is a partially labeled bottle. So it doesn't have the date, uh, not the dates, the time, it doesn't have the temperature and it doesn't have the initials. So we need to be able to know who collected this, at what time they collected it, what the temperature was, because what if the temperature was above six and we got it above 10? So then we'll be able to tell why there was that discrepancy there. And they also must match the sample. This is something that I got today that I was, I was able to quickly put into there. The samples were obviously switch. The solar pad was the Digester 3 and the Digester 3 was the solar pad. So all you have to do there is cross out, you know, the, the sample name, rewrite it and just initial it. So that hap I know that can happen sometimes, but I, I was able to tell because I run these samples what if, some, what if I wasn't there and they didn't know? They would have to call you guys or they dump them out saying this is the wrong sample and they wouldn't get analyzed. So now moving on to the chain of custodies. So they must be able to match the sample with the chain of custody. This is why we need all that information on the bottle or on the labels. All the samples that are used for permit, monitor, permit monitoring should be handled with the anticipation for their potential use as evidence in legal actions. So you guys could be called to testify and we need to be able to match that exact bottle to that exact chain of custody. So in any litigation, adherence to the chain of custody principles has two main goals. It's to ensure that the sample collected is the same sample that was analyzed and to ensure that the, the sample is not altered, changed or substituted or tampered with between collection and analysis. So I know that you guys have to you know, get them transferred from a courier. So you guys need to make sure you guys see that the courier signs off on it because if anything happens between those like 20, 25 minutes, then that means the courier is responsible for that sample, not you guys. And you guys need to make sure you guys are watching that. So in the chain of custody, it's pretty much the same thing that you need in the sample label, the source and the location, the dates, the times, the person who collected it, printed and signature, not just signature. Cause I get some that are signatures and I don't know everybody's names and sometimes it's a different operator than usual, and I can't make out you guys' signatures. I get some that are just um, an initial and a number, like your guys' uh, agency number. I don't know who you guys are by numbers either, so I need to see a printed name. The type of sample, the number of containers, the preservative, and the temperature of the auto sampler, and just make sure it cannot be typed. That has to be field data written on there. And uh, the printed name and signature of individuals who have had custody with the of the have custody of the sample with date and time of transfer. So, like I said, the courier. And also optional information that may be required in some circumstances, like when there's a failure or a non-routine sample, which is a, like an analysis required that we usually don't require on a on a sample. We would like to see that written on there too. Um, notes regarding any condition, maybe there was a odor that wasn't usually there or a color or 
you know, maybe you just got half of a bottle uh, worth of sample. Uh, any field test results if you feel like they are necessary or the chain of custody um, asks for them. And of course, templates should be used appropriately. Sometimes I get a template that is meant to be used on Monday that is used on Wednesday and there's some like issues going on there. So this is your chain, your source, your whoever sampled it, the event, which is a Monday or a Wednesday or a weekend, the operator, your dates, your times, your site name, your location. If it's a comper, grab your number of bottles, the type of bottle and preservative analysis required. So if it's a daily or if it's a special sample uh, requirement, like I said. The auto sampler temperature, any comments, like sampler failed in the middle of it, we brought you guys a grab, but here's what we got from our um, composite sample. The signature, the name, date, and time. So this is a completed chain of custody. If any of this information is missing, I will send it back and need it because it is a legal document and it needs to be filled out completely. Some of you guys have, I know, I've t talked to you about that. I remember when you were RP1. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so chain of custody requirements, it must be neat and legible. Any changes that are made are made by crossing out with just one line, correct information if needed, and date and initial the changes if needed. Um, so a representative in the lab, which is me, who is receiving, will verify that they're complete and they match to the samples. And like I said, um, if not, they will be returned. And I do make copies of these, and they are put in our system so you guys can pull them up for your records. But if you guys are, you know, filling them out wrong and I'm sending them back and you guys are having, like, a lag time to send them back, they won't be available as soon as possible to you guys. So the sooner you guys get them back to me when I send them back to you guys to complete them, then the better it is for all of us to have them in our, in our records. So within a week is the best time, um, hopefully no longer than that. If sooner, then even better for us. So that's it. Any questions? A question. When you send them back, do you send them back directed to the operators or a facility? To the operators. For example, if it was you, like if you missed the date, I will send it back to you. Okay. Yeah, I won't send. I just won't be like, RP2, please fill this out. No, it has to be the person because they're the ones who collected the sample. They're the ones who are liable for the sample and all the information that comes with it. Anything? Yes. On the volume on the samples, mm -hmm. like right where the aftertaste is, just below the neck of the bottle. That's because mm -hmm. the other bottle you were saying was good, was like half a bowl. The so gallon like, one? Yeah, the gallon. Yeah, it was probably the the um, angle that it was, but it was it's like three quarters of the way that it would be the perfect amount. Okay. Yeah. So, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Can I just exit it? Okay.